this next section is to actually go through a few different cases and to discuss as a group using multiple choice polls how we might actually manage these patients and how we can maximize the quality of the fittings for these patients. So the first case we have is Francis. He's 35 years old. He's a long-term hearing aid user, but his hearing aids were recently damaged during a car crash. He's got an he's come in for an ENT appointment to investigate the increase in tinnitus since this crash. But as a uh, as a clinic, we've been given a directive to do as much remote work as possible uh, because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, this patient's also not keen to refer, return to the clinic for his first fitting. He's an experienced user, so he doesn't need re-instructing on how to use the hearing aids. He just wants a new set of hearing aids uh, to replace those that he's lost. So there's a poll on the uh, just below me here, which I'll open now. What is the best alternative method to in situ real ear measurements to verify this fitting? So I'll broadcast the results there. So 24% have uh, discussed aided word recognition. Um, the challenge for aided word recognition in this case is that if we, um, we'd have to ask the patient to return to clinic. So unless we can fit the hearing aids um, today, then we'll have to ask them to, to return. And we've been given a directive to avoid as many uh, appointments as possible and do as much remotely as possible. And um, in that case, to do an aided word recognition assessment, uh, it'd be quite challenging to to measure between the unaided and aided portions. We we can't guarantee over a video link the the stimulus level that we'd be giving. So we'd need to uh, we'd need to ask them to come back into the clinic for that. And that applies also for the functional gain verification method as well. Uh, for functional gain, especially, we would need a, a calibrated sound field um, in order to to take those measurements. So um, RECDs are definitely our, our best method here. Um, and thank you for those who, who are honest and said, uh, I don't know. Essentially, that is the, the point of this, this session, isn't it? So if we are doing an RECD, what is the, the best RECD technique that we could use? So we've given you a few options here to choose from. So again, we've got this patient in clinic today where we've done a, another hearing test. So we can take an RECD today, uh, but we don't have the, we don't have any other uh, resources for this patient. So those results I think have settled down. So I'll broadcast those and end the poll. So if we go back and have a look at this, uh, all the information we have for this case, and then we'll go through each one of these options and see what we think. Uh, so predicted RECDs, absolutely an option here. Uh, we've indicated no um, anatomical challenges for this patient. So uh, essentially we can assume that they've got a, a normal or near normal ear canal, in which case the predicted RECDs will probably be quite close to this patient's um, real RECD. Um, in order to, to do own mould RECDs, we'd need to have the patient's mould with us today. Um, so we've said that the hearing aids have been damaged during the car crash. So if the moulds weren't damaged during the car crash, so perhaps they actually have the moulds with them, then we could do that. Uh, but it's quite likely that, that that's not the case. If the, the hearing aids have been damaged, then perhaps the rest of it has been damaged as well. But that would be a really good way of, of guaranteeing the uh, the acoustics of the ear with the hearing aids in is to use the own patient's the the patient's own ear mold. The other option, uh, which most people have have chosen here, is to use the SPL60 probe. So with the SPL60 probe, we can take measurements of the patient's ear. So we can do an on-ear RECD, so we don't have to use predicted. But we can do it without the patient's hearing aids uh, with us in clinic. Obviously, there is a, a slight uh, concession there to, to the absolute accuracy. So versus the own mould, there's a, a slight concession to accuracy. But quite frankly, um, the difference is as long as we've got a good placement of the SPL probe, um, those differences will be minimal. Um, and so we, we'd probably say that in this case, the, the SPL60 probe is the easiest way to achieve a high level of accuracy. Uh, for the for the fitting of this patient. 
Okay, so that is case one. Let's move into the next case. So this is case two. Uh, this is Jamie, he's 10 years old. Uh, he's in clinic today and he really enjoys the uh, the process of having his he hearing tested, but he's non-compliant when his ears are touched. Uh, he's a good hearing aid user and he's used hearing aids for a few years, but he does like to insert his hearing aids again. He doesn't like anybody else touching his ears. His ear canals are small and they're prone to infections. Uh, but today uh, on otoscopy, we can see that his ears are clear. He has a very large vent in the in the mold, again, to help sort of mitigate some of the challenges of the the infections that he's prone to. So we'll open this poll. What is the best alternative method to verify this fitting? So REMS are challenging to do for, for this case. We'd need to have him sitting still and quiet for a long period of time uh, and placing the probe tube might be quite a challenge for, for this patient. And I'll end it there and broadcast these results. So really good spread of answers here. So this is really interesting. Um, definitely one of those cases where you have to think on your feet, isn't it? Um, this kind of clinic can be can be quite challenging. You can't necessarily uh, plan every element of this clinic out. So aided word recognition. We've established that that Jamie's really um, he likes the testing process. The biggest challenge with Jamie being ten years old is selecting the the best. Um, the best word lists to use. Um, we'd also need to consider edu educational level as well. So there's a, a bit of a challenge in using aid word recognition. But you might have found during the, the testing process that he's um, quite quite capable, in which case an aided word recognition would be a pretty good way of, of verifying this fitting. The biggest challenge with using aided word recognition for a fitting like this is knowing what adjustments to make to the hearing aid in order to achieve uh, to achieve your goals. So you might find that uh, there are particular frequencies that, that aren't really covered in, in the word testing. Um, and so knowing how to identify which aspects of the hearing aid to adjust is quite difficult. Functional gain. Um, Jamie again has been has demonstrated that he really enjoys the hearing test process. And by doing functional gain measurements, we can actually target particular frequencies or frequency bands that we'd like to adjust to and we'd like to sort of alter in the hearing aid fitting. Um, so functional gain is quite a good method here. And then RECDs, again, another really good method for, for this patient. Um, we might be able to get a just sort of one RECD measurement done so that then we can do the rest of the verification. The biggest challenge for RECDs for Jamie is for placing the probe microphone. Again, that's the biggest challenge for REMS uh, initially. Uh, for RECDs, we don't have to have him sitting still for the entire RECD process. We just need to make sure we get that one really good ear portion of the RECD measured. Um, so it seems like most people just about would attempt the RECD first. And I think that's a really good option here. Attempt the highest quality level that you can do first. So attempt that RECD. And then if you need to abandon it and move into other verification systems, you, you can do. So if we go with RECD first. So what is the best technique for the RECDs in this case? Let's end that and broadcast the results here. So technique wise for Jamie. Um, own mould, like we say, is normally preferable because of the acoustics um, of the of the ear canal are retained there. So we, we can actually measure what the hearing aid acoustics would, would be like. But let's just have another look at this case. The very last thing here is that um, Jamie's got a very large vent in his mould. So large vents for RECDs can pose a bit of a problem because an RECD is the, the coupler portion that you measure is entirely closed. So it's a closed cavity at both ends. If you have a large vent in your mold when you measure the ear portion of the RECD, you can um, essentially induce some error. And you can end up, uh, especially in the low frequencies, uh, not achieving the, the gain that you want to achieve. And so the, uh, when you measure the ear portion, essentially it will indicate that more um, that more low frequencies are needed.
in which case you can end up under amplifying the, the low frequencies for, for this patient. So there is a challenge with own mold measurements for, for this particular patient. But we'll come back to this in a second. Um, the SPL, uh, the other, sorry, the other challenge for the own mold measurement for, for Jamie would be placing the probe mic and getting the mold in at the same time. Jamie's sort of established to us that he likes to put his own hearing aids in. So if we're trying to hold the probe microphone and place the, the molds into his ears for him, then we, we might uh, sort of come up with a bit of non-compliance. Uh, and taking that measurement, we then might sort of lose our only opportunity then to do the real ear measurement. Which brings us into the SPL probe, which was uh, the second choice for, for the group. So the SPL probe gives us a slight advantage over those, those two challenges. One, um, we don't have the large venting aspect of it, so we don't have to sort of mess with the mould and, and cause any challenges there. Um, it's also much easier to place the uh, the SPL probe in than it is to do with the patient's own mould with the probe microphone in there, especially for Jamie. So all we need to do is place one rigid uh, probe into the ear, uh, which makes it much easier then to measure it. And we, you know, we might be able to sort of get him to, to tolerate that for just a few seconds while we measure the ear portion. Uh, we might be able to bribe him or keep him distracted perhaps with, um, with a little video or, or a cartoon or a book or something. But getting the, the probe mic to be in the correct position is easier with the SPL probe than it may be with this patient's own ear mould. Um, so it might be recommended that we actually start with the SPL probe because we might, it might be just that little bit easier to get the ear portion. And then 16% of us have decided that using a predicted RECD is a, is a good option for Jamie. Um, Jamie, his ear canals are small and they're prone to, to infections. So uh, probably prone to infections because of the size of them. So if we used a predicted RECD, Jamie might be quite far from the normative data. So it, we might find that actually we're, we're verifying against predicted RECDs that are, are nothing like Jamie's ears. Um, so yeah, it, it can it can pose a bit of a challenge using predicted RECDs when the patient is is slightly further away from from the norms than than we might expect. So let's say we we have used the, the we have used Jamie's own mold, which is what most of the the group have suggested we do, and we we've done that knowing the, the particular challenges that the venting might pose. In that case, how can we supplement the RECD and ensure that the fitting is correct in those low frequencies, which we know can be um, can be made inaccurate by the venting? And that is starting to settle down now. So I'll end the poll and broadcast the results. So if you have said that we that we can't supplement this fitting, and, and I think that's a, a fair enough answer. After all, it was one of the options that we gave. Using questionnaires, yeah, so questionnaires will help us to supplement this fitting. Um, it's obviously a bit long term, and this is where we start thinking about using the, the remote um, follow ups that we can we can use nowadays. So using questionnaires and, and especially maybe questionnaires targeted at, um, at the patient's parents, at, at Jamie's parents, might help us to to understand whether our fitting was accurate or, or if it needs any adjustments. Uh, when it comes to questionnaires, it's often useful to, to choose your questionnaires sort of right at the beginning of the journey because it can help to validate the entire process. Um, targeting questionnaires just at, at one fitting can be quite challenging because obviously hearing aids are worn over a long period of time. And then functional gain is our other option. Absolutely. So functional gain can really help us verify, especially these low frequencies. So we know that perhaps using the patient's own mold has induced some errors in the low frequencies because of the venting. So the, that venting meant that the low frequencies were escaping while uh, taking the, the ear portion of the measurement. So if, you, if we use functional gain, we can focus that just on those low frequencies. And again, we know Jamie is, is really tolerant and enjoys the, the process of the hearing testing. So if we've got some sound field um, PTA results for him in the low frequencies, we can then check that with our hearing aid in and with the vents open and as they should be. 
And then we can start to sort of make some adjustments on our fitting in those low frequencies, depending on how well he performs in the aided condition. So here we're starting to marry two or, or maybe even three, because of course questionnaires can, can always be applied. So we're starting to, to marry a few different techniques here and sort of offset the challenges of, of each of them with each other uh, to really sort of give a really well-rounded um, set of care and, and verification. And for me, again, Jamie being uh, somebody with, with learning difficulties and, and additional needs, so he poses additional challenges um, and may not be able to, to explain himself exactly what's, uh, what's difficult about his hearing and, and what, he's, uh, what he's missing. In those cases, especially, I want to do as much as I can to, to support and to ensure the quality of, of that fitting. So yeah, again, I would agree with with the group here. I think we've uh, we've come up with a really good plan for for Jamie and his fitting. Case three. Let's move in and have a look at Martha. So Martha is seventy six years old. She lives in a care home, um, and is currently bed bound after a fall. So unfortunately, she's had a fall recently, which is is confining her to bed. We measured her audiogram three weeks ago when she was well and, and she was mobile. So we were able to put in her into a, um, a, a mobile enclosed setting. We took impressions at the time as well. So we knew we would come back to fit her with, with hearing aids. And those are the hearing aids, those impressions we've, we've brought back with us today. Uh, because of her, her age and her illness as well, there's an urgency for the hearing aids to be fitted. So we really want to fit them today. We've come back um, to fit the hearing aids. So we really want to, to fit them today. Now, because she's bed bound today and her bed is up against the wall, it means that we can only actually access one of her ears easily. So only one ear is sort of uh, pointing towards the room. So it makes it really challenging then to, to uh, get to the other ear. In terms of REMS, although, you know, absolutely you can have mobile and, and portable REM systems. For Martha today, because she's next to the wall, we've got a reflective surface. And because of her um, uh, immobility today, it's going to be actually quite unsafe to place probe mics um, and to, to ensure that they're going to retain in the ear. You know, we'd have to sort of really lean over and, and have a look in the ear as we're placing the probe mics. Uh, so REMS really aren't a, a good solution for Martha today. But of course, we absolutely want to verify her, her fitting. So again, that, <laughs> that question that I keep coming back to, what is our best method other than in situ really measures to verify this fitting? These results are, are settling quite quickly, so I'm going to broadcast and end that result here. So the first one, functional gain. Now we'd need to calibrate the sound field in order to do a functional gain measurement today. Um, so that would be really challenging. And, um, and comparing it to the PTA that we measured before, if that wasn't measured in a, in a sound field, frankly, we, we will really struggle to get any functional gain measurements that have a level of accuracy that is suitable. Aid, aided word recognition, brilliant, uh, brilliant answer for this one. Um, many systems we can, uh, although it won't be calibrated for speech reception thresholds, uh, we may be able to do some sort of word recognition percentage scores and uh, see how well she does with and without. So though we haven't got a calibrated uh, field for today, we can immediately compare between before and after fitting the hearing aids, how well she's doing on aided word recognition. So we can use a, um, as a speech from hard drive on our, on our audiometer, or maybe just um, a live voice if we're, if we're particularly good at um, making sure that, that we're, we're using the same level of, of presentation if you're doing that live voice. So aided word recognition is, is a good way to, to start today. And I think for, for this as well, because she's in a different situation to before, you know, things have moved quite quickly. I would be inclined to look at aided word recognition just to get a good sense cognitively of, as well of how Martha's doing. But then, of course, we also come to RECDs. So most of the group have, have gone for RECDs. And actually, when we come to verifying this fitting, I think this is really the, the best method to get a really high quality verification. So let's say we've taken an RECD in her left ear. So her left ear is the one that's that's pointing into the room. Um, and the, the hearing aids are maybe a custom 
a hearing aid or a receiver in the canal hearing aid with a custom tip on it. Um, here you go, here's an example, here's my hearing aid. So a custom tip on a, on a rick, which means that we can't use the um, own mold method because we can't deliver the stimulus through the mold. So we've used the SPL probe to, to measure the, the RECD today. So having a look at this RECD, do we think this is of good quality or of poor quality? And uh, I, might, I might be tripping some of you up with this one. It's quite difficult to see the scale on this um, on this measurement, uh, but we'll we'll have a look and see what we think. I'll broadcast these results and end this poll here. So conventional wisdom says that uh, if there's a negative RECD, then generally it's of poor quality. And so that really comes from the idea that RECDs are mostly used in children, where the real ear is a smaller volume than the 2cc coupler that you do for the coupler measurement, in which case we would expect a negative RECD to imply a poor quality RECD. But actually for Martha, um, what we've done here is use a 0.4cc coupler. Uh, and that's because we're doing an extended frequency range RECD. So we've gone right up to 16 kilohertz on here. Uh, so if I use this pointer here, we can see on this part of the scale, we've gone right up to 16 kilohertz. So in order to measure RECDs up to 16 kilohertz, we need to use a 0.4 cc coupler. A 0.4 cc coupler is obviously a lot smaller than a real ear. So we would expect there to be a negative portion in the uh, in the RECD, and we can actually see that here. So the SPL needed in uh, the SPL measured in the coupler would be greater for a particular stimulus level than the SPL um, measured in the ear. So if the ear is of a larger volume, then the SPL will be lower. So we would expect a negative RECD in this case. So actually, um, on this ear, this RECD is is good enough. So let's move into the next one. So we've said that the left ear is the one that's sort of out into the room and we've used the SPL probe. So we've also attempted here a, an RECD on the right. Do we think this right ear RECD is good enough? And I'll end the poll there. So 62% are saying, no, this isn't good enough. And 21% are saying, yes. So if we have a look at some aspects of this RECD, now in the low frequencies, it's a severely negative RECD, way more than can be accounted for by the, the difference in canal volume to, to coupler volume. So this is actually saying to me that I don't think we had a, a good seal in the ear canal. Essentially, we've measured a much larger volume than is um, defined by the ear canal. So perhaps in sort of leaning over and blindly placing the probe in, in the ear canal, we haven't actually managed to, to get a good seal. And then in the high frequencies here, with it um, being, you know, I don't think we've actually got a good probe depth as well. So I don't think we've actually managed to get the probe in very far since high frequencies really are a bit off as well. So in general, I think this is quite a poor quality RECD and I wouldn't like to use this to, to verify my fitting. So if that's the case, what can we do? Um, we've got a good left-sided RECD. So what can we do for the, uh, for the right ear. I will end the poll there and broadcast these results. So the first option we've got up here that 37% of you have um, gone for is to copy the RECD from the right uh, from the right ear. I think actually I've, I've made an error there. It should say the copy it from the left ear. So sorry if you you didn't select that one because of uh, because of that. So the left ear was of good quality. The right ear was of poor quality. Um, if we can assume that Martha is, is fairly symmetrical across both sides, then we could actually copy the RECDs over. Uh, and most systems will, will allow you to do that. Those of you that were maybe thrown by the, uh, the right ear, left ear situation that we, we've done here, have said to use a predicted RECD. And yet that's a perfectly valid situ uh, answer here as well. Um, again, Martha is probably, you know, we're assuming she's pretty normal. There's nothing in the case to say that her anatomy is, isn't normal. So predicted is also a, a good option here um, and using the manufacturer's first fit. So that is always an option, um, but essentially it, it really doesn't allow us to, to verify objectively the, the hearing aid fitting. Um, 
so it's but it's always there it's always an option to fall back on to is to use the manufacturer's first fit okay so those are all of the the cases that i wanted to go through today in order to sort of um to, to get your answers to sort of talk through and, and discuss and essentially the the main um learning outcome i think really as, as we put all of this together is that there are loads of techniques that you can use um, and it's a challenge often to think of which one to use on the fly but hopefully by going through a few cases where uh we've discussed it together you, it'll give you that sort of um, ability and that fluency to try and uh, uh, move between different verification techniques or even supplement different techniques um, as we go